a drink you like, or find the right position in your bed, because we just took off for a new space journey, and this one will take us to Mars, the first manned mission to Mars ever. And given that we do it by imagination, I can already tell you that everything is going to work just fine. We will be back to Earth, sound and safe. And as always, you are free to let go and fall asleep whenever you feel like it along the journey. To entertain you during the trip, I will tell you about our destination, the Red Planet, and the challenges to overcome to travel to Mars, land, stay, and come back, from the energy necessary and the distance to radiation or cohabitation of a small group of astronauts for a several month long journey. We will also talk about terraforming as a concept and how it could be applied to Mars and many other things. So there's a lot to discuss and as you know this story will soon also be available in audio streaming on Spotify or Apple Music and it is also posted to my Patreon as a podcast with or without background space sounds. There are also timestamps in the first comment and on your screen if you wish to navigate the chapters or resume it later where you left it. Earth is already getting smaller and we have crossed the orbit of the moon. But there are still millions of miles to cross before we reach Mars. In past space cruises, we had to travel faster than light to reach exoplanets and even other galaxies. Such speeds defy the laws of physics as we know them. And there is good reason to estimate that they cannot physically be achieved. But tonight, traveling at a few percentage points of light speed will be enough to complete the round trip in about one hour. Such a speed has never been reached by man. But it is theoretically possible, at least. So what is the distance between Earth and Mars? There is not a single answer to this question, because the distance is constantly changing. Since you tuned in to this story, the distance has changed by thousands of miles as the two planets follow their orbits around the Sun at high speed. Sometimes they are on either side of the Sun And when this happens, Mars is invisible from Earth. When the two planets are on opposite sides of the Sun, the distance is maximal and it reaches 400 million kilometers. This would be like 10,000 times the circumference of Earth. But there are also times when Mars is much closer when Earth and Mars are aligned on the same side of the Sun. In this case, the distance drops to about 55 million kilometers, almost eight times less. This is less than 40 million miles. About every 26 months, Mars reaches this close approach. This is how it is called to Earth, and this is the right moment to take advantage of, to send missions to Mars. 
but the distance when a close approach happens is not always exactly the same, because it is not that simple. The two orbits of Earth and Mars are not exactly on the same plane. They are slightly tilted with respect to each other. And the exact shapes of these orbits change constantly because they are influenced by the position of other bodies, especially Jupiter, which has a significant influence on the orbit of Mars. At the scale of the solar system, the that have to be made to take into account velocities and the influence of all bodies involved. So there's a lot of modelizing and mathematics going on to make accurate estimates because a probe cannot miss its destination which is constantly moving by millions of miles. And this is what would happen without good knowledge of orbits, speeds and all the factors that impact them. So with all these elements at play, not all close approaches between Mars and Earth are exactly the same. In 2003, Mars made its closest approach to Earth in 60,000 years, and it won't be that close again until 2287. In the meantime, we will have to cross a bit more distance when close encounters happen. But as I said, there is one about every 26 months, every two years. The last one was in 2020. The next one will happen in 2022. And there is already a next NASA mission planned, if not in 2022, then when the next close approach presents itself, a mission known as Mars Sample Return, a campaign to bring samples of Mars, soil and rocks back to Earth. Given that probes or spaceships need to come back, these missions need to be planned over several years. It is not possible to just arrive land, take samples during a few weeks and come back immediately. Because during the time spent on the planet, the distance with Earth has increased again by millions and millions of miles. Now, the distance and time in space are not the only elements that matter. Energy consumption to go, land and come back is maybe even more important. And the shortest trip is not necessarily the most realistic or achievable. Storing energy, fuel, is complicated. It occupies space. It has to be sent to space. And as soon as space flight began, astronomers and engineers started studying the most efficient path into space when it comes to energy consumption. An economical way of traveling between planets is to jump from one orbit to another, following an elliptical orbit. This kind of transfer is called Oman transfer orbit. This is the orbit followed, for example, by the InSight probe sent by NASA a few years ago. It implies approximately nine months travel time from Earth to Mars, then a stay of about 16 to 17 months on Mars, waiting for the next transfer window, and another nine month trip to return to Earth, that is to say three years in total for the round trip. A method that can help consume less energy when approaching the target, the planet, 
is called ballistic capture. What is it? When spacecrafts use a Oman transfer orbit, it typically requires the spacecraft to burn fuel in order to slow down at the distant planet, because when the ship approaches it, it travels faster in space than its destination. It has to, to catch up with it. The fuel necessary to slow down has to be transported all the way from Earth, which adds to the cost and complexity of the craft. But with the method of ballistic capture, the spacecraft is just placed in advance on the orbit of its destination planet before the planet arrives. When the target arrives, the craft is captured by the planet's gravity and it can put itself in orbit around it with small thrusters for adjustment but without a big expense of energy. Now another possible method to slow down spacecrafts when they reach their target is a maneuver called aerobraking. Aerobraking consists in flying the craft through the atmosphere, so it has to be a body with an atmosphere at the low point of the orbit. The frictions, the drag, slows it down and the advantage is that this method uses the environment. It doesn't consume more energy than the minimum necessary to position the craft on the right orbit. So all this gives you an idea of the variety of mission plans, of possible paths that have been imagined and tested. We are now halfway to our destination. So before we talk about landing and the environment we will find on Mars, let's take a look at the formation of the planet and what it is made of. As you may know, the dominant theory about the formation of planets in the solar system is that it all started with a large accretion disk, a disk of gases and dust that was kept together and put in motion by gravitation. Most of the mass of matter concentrated in the center to form the Sun, but not all of it. The periphery of the new star was still filled with matter, with dust, in orbit around it. And through collisions over millions and millions of years, this dust snowballed into bigger and bigger rocks and boulders. After millions of revolutions around the Sun, Bigger rocks and protoplanets progressively cleaned up their orbits of dust and smaller bodies by absorbing them or turning them into their satellites. Like for Earth, this process is believed to have been completed about four and a half billion years ago for Mars. At this point, rocky planets in the solar system had eliminated most of the smaller rocks and boulders on their orbit, and they had taken a ball shape. This globe shape happens because of gravity. Above a certain size, bodies become round, whereas smaller objects like asteroids or comets can keep other shapes they are not large enough and massive enough to form a ball of matter. It is hard to figure out the history of Mars from Earth. On our planet, we can study the geological timeline by analyzing the layers of rocks and minerals. On Mars, nothing like that has been made yet. A few samples of soil could be analyzed by probes, but nothing comparable. But it doesn't mean hypotheses cannot be made. The age 
of the surface of a planet can be estimated by counting the number of visible craters. A higher number and density of craters points to older terrain. But Mars also has experienced intense volcanism along its history, and volcanism resets the surface terrain. It also has glaciers, winds, possibly running water in the past, so craters may have been erased. With these limited means of estimating the age of the surface, the oldest part is believed to be in the southern hemisphere. The surface there would be about 3.8 billion years old. In the northern hemisphere, the landscapes are dominated by large plains that would have appeared later, after the last waves of bombardment by asteroids. It is believed that after its formation, for about 400 million years, that would be 4.5 to 4.1 billion years ago, Mars had a dense atmosphere, which formed as a result of asteroid and comet's impact, and gases escaping from the mantle of the planet. This early atmosphere would have been much denser than ours on Earth, implying higher pressure, and under these conditions, the water vapor in the atmosphere could have condensed into an ocean, possibly even a global ocean, but one that existed at high temperature, a little bit like in a pressure cooker. Slowly, over millions of years, this large body of water started to cool down, and this could have opened the first window for the possible emergence of life around 4.4 to 4.3 billion years ago. But this is purely speculative and based on modelizing. There is no direct proof of it. In any case, this early atmosphere would have lacked stability because as the planet kept cooling down, it would have escaped into space or become incorporated into the surface. After liquid water and high pressure, the atmosphere would have become thinner and thinner, and the planet increasingly cooled as a result, turning water into ice. The following 400 million years from 4.1 to 3.7 billion years ago. So, new drastic changes. Bombardment by asteroids could have kept happening, like on Earth, and the southern hemisphere, the surface in the southern hemisphere, would date from this period. Like on Earth, Mars probably has a liquid core made of primarily metal, Metals tend to converge to the center of planets due to their higher mass. The core is covered by a mantle and a much thinner solid crust. In average, this crust today would be around 50 kilometers thick to be compared with 40 kilometers on Earth. Once again, this is an estimate that looks possible, reasonable, but contrary to Earth, it could not be proven directly and by multiple methods. But at the time, 4 billion years ago, this crust was much thinner, and the planet had a period of intense volcanic activity. Red volcanoes appeared. After our landing, we will pay a visit to one of them, Olympus Mons and fracturing of the surface made a, a large rift valley system appear. As a result of this volcanic activity, 
that pull the gases and the ashes into the atmosphere, the planet would have stopped cooling down because the thicker blanket of gases trapped more solar heat, the greenhouse effect. At this point, clouds probably developed and with them precipitations running to the ground. This could explain the valleys that were possibly dug by running water billions of years ago by erosion and at the time there could have been also lakes forming in the basins and craters. Maybe also an ocean covering the north of the planet. A clue that points to such a scenario with the existence of an ocean, or at least running water, is the analysis of rocks on the surface by rovers. They indicate the presence of clay minerals that typically form by prolonged exposure to groundwater. During this second period, another window for the possible emergence of life, the second one, theoretically opened. There was liquid water, an atmosphere, and also maybe a magnetic field around the planet like on Earth. The inside would have been in motion like on Earth, creating a magnetic dynamo that would have shielded the planet from radiation. In theory, this would make several of the conditions that allowed the appearance of life on Earth possibly present on Mars at the time. But again, these conditions didn't last more than a few dozen million years. Mars is a smaller planet than Earth, and it cooled down faster. As a result of it, the magnetic dynamo would have shut down and the magnetic field would have disappeared. But more preoccupying for the possibility of life at the surface is the fact that atmospheric conditions continued to change. With its smaller mass than Earth, and without a magnetic field, Mars kept losing its atmosphere that dissipated into space millions of years after millions of years. What remained of the atmosphere started to cool down again, and with the accumulation of gases like sulfur, pulled by volcanoes, rains would have become increasingly acidic along a period of 800 million years, until about 3.6 billion years ago. Once again, this hypothesis is supported by the analysis of soils that were apparently altered by acidic groundwater. As the temperature went down, much of the water would have frozen, possibly under the surface. Bombardments by asteroids that had become less and less frequent over hundreds of millions of years almost came to a halt, like on Earth at the same time, and in the rest of the solar system. Maybe punctually there were still asteroid impacts that melted huge quantities of subsurface ice and caused catastrophic floods that could only be short-lived because the water was reabsorbed into the ground and frozen again. After a billion and a half years of catastrophic reverses in its appearance and atmosphere, Mars would have then entered a period of relative stability that continues to this day. Stability in the sense that there were no more large-scale geological changes or climatic changes. The surface of Mars was now dry not much state of its previous atmospheres, and the new atmosphere has become so thin that there is very little pressure at the surface, so
so few that water vaporizes instantly at the surface. There can no longer be a liquid water. Over three billion years, there was still erosion with powerful winds. Occasionally, volcanoes appeared and modified the surface, like they do on Earth. But there doesn't seem to be plate tectonics like on Earth and the face of Mars may not have changed radically for a very long time now. Seen from space, it has this red color that comes from the oxidation of iron. It is rust that gives Mars its name of red planet. The poles remain covered in ice, and the size of these uh, ice continents at the poles probably varies over very long periods, depending on the distance from Mars to the Sun. I will tell you more about the conditions at the surface, but it is now time to land because we have reached our destination. We made this journey quickly, but for astronauts it will take months. Astronauts have already spent extended periods of time in space, including more than the time necessary to reach Mars. But it was in space stations that stayed on a low orbit around Earth. The psychological burden of knowing you are traveling further and further away from your planet in a potentially dangerous adventure in an environment where only technology can keep you alive, this cannot be looked over. This probably recreates the experience of the explorers who left Europe by sea in the 15th and 16th centuries, with their crews at the mercy of unpredictable oceans for months. There were situations of mutinies or despair, now this human factor can certainly be overcome by selecting highly trained astronauts and making sure their group dynamic works for the mission. But the psychological and social dimension of such a journey, it brings challenges that cannot be fully eliminated. And then there are biological, physical difficulties Human bodies have not evolved for life in space, and especially in a zero-gravity environment. It is not just the loss of bone or muscle when we don't need to compensate for gravity for an extended period of time. There are other aspects that affect metabolism and the way our bodies heal. For example, it would be more difficult to treat a fracture without gravity. And this is also something astronauts would need to pay attention to. They could not really afford to hurt themselves. But the biggest medical issue in space is certainly radiation. On Earth, we are shielded from radiation by our magnetic field and the atmosphere. The radiations we talk about here are streams of tiny particles, bits of atoms, or of energy that exist in space or come from the sun. The sun ejects them constantly in every direction and they travel through the solar system. This is a big problem for extended stays in space because it is hard to fully shield against them, including inside spaceships or stations. One day spent in the International Space Station, for example, is equivalent to roughly 10 sessions of chest X-rays. If it is for a day or two, there are no measurable consequences. But when it is for months or years, the damage to uh, the DNA, 
to eyes, to the immune system, can become concerning. It is more than enough to significantly rise risks of cancer, and the ISS is far from being the worst place in space. It is on a low orbit and still within the Earth's magnetic field, so traveling further in space will imply higher doses of radiation. An even more insidious effect of radiation exposure is that it may affect cognitive function over time, making astronauts may be less able to respond to unforeseen circumstances or stressful situations. So, what can be done to minimize the problem of radiation? There are vests and the development made of materials that are efficient at blocking free particles like protons. For example, vests made of polyethylene. Polyethylene is easy to make, it's a plastic. We use it all the time. This is the material of bottled water. There are radiation sensing instruments that could alert astronauts when they go through a place where radiation is more intense, and they could move to a part of the craft where they are better shielded. Metals that make the hulls of spacecrafts are not good at stopping radiation, but other materials are. Apart from polyethylene, hydrogen works well, and it would be possible to integrate hydrogen-rich materials into the spacecraft's structure, or maybe just align the walls with water tanks. Now these options also raise issues of weight, because all this has to be sent into space. Another solution being explored by scientists, and it sounds a lot like science fiction, is to give the craft its own electromagnetic field generated by a device on board the craft. It is probably for the long term, and it creates other problems like the energy necessary to make it work constantly. But that would be an ideal long-term solution to the problems of radiation for space travel. Because until such a solution is found, Long-haul space travel with astronauts will be hard and a direct threat to their health. One day in space, outside the magnetic field of Earth, is equivalent to about 700 days on Earth when it comes to the dose of radiation received. It's almost like two years in a single day. In other terms, in one month in space, Outside the Earth's magnetic field, astronauts receive almost the equivalent to a lifetime of radiation on Earth, if they are not protected. At this point, the issue of shielding against radiation is one of the biggest stakes for scientists who work on future manned missions to Mars or beyond. But we have now reached the proximity of Mars, and the first leg of our trip is done. Sometimes there are storms of dust on the planet that can reach global dimensions and completely hide the ground. This is one of the difficulties of the harsh environment we will find at the surface. But not today. Through the very thin atmosphere of the planet, we can directly see the ground and its variety of plains, craters mainly in the southern hemisphere, mountains, rifts, all in various shades of red to brown, except the white caps of ice at the poles. These caps are primarily water ice, but not only. 
they also contain frozen carbon dioxide. Like Earth, Mars has seasons, because the planet rotates on an axis that is not perfectly perpendicular to its orbit, so it does not always present the same side to the Sun. When it is summer, for one hemisphere, for one pole, that is to say, the pole receives direct sunlight, it is winter for the other one that stays in the dark for months. Without an atmosphere that regulates temperatures like on our planet, the dark pole becomes extremely cold for months, so much that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere freezes and falls to the ground. This covers the dark pole with a layer of carbon dioxide ice. But then when the summer arrives, sunlight sublimes carbon dioxide. That is to say, it turns it instantly from solid to gas. Carbon dioxide liberated as gas brings dust with it in the atmosphere. And clouds form, clouds that look like cirrus clouds on Earth. Until the next change of season, when carbon dioxide freezes again and falls back to the ground. We will keep exploring the surface, but now let's land. We will do it like probably the first human missions will landing in a rocket that would be able to take off at the end of the mission, return to the spacecraft left in orbit around the planet, and start the trip back to Earth. A dozen small crafts have already landed successfully on Mars since the 1970s. There was Mars 3, sent by the Soviet space program, and Viking 1 and 2 by NASA. Then there was a long period when funding issues and other priorities put missions to Mars on hold. They resumed 20 years later, in the 1990s, with the appearance of rovers like Sojourner, Opportunity, Curiosity, and more recently Perseverance, which landed in February 2021. Between these missions that have collected samples, sent images from the ground, and uh, the cartography made by probes in orbit, our knowledge of Mars has increased, has improved dramatically in the past 40 or 50 years. And clearly between these successful missions and uh, the various long-term projects for manned missions from public and private agents that exist at the moment, Mars is a hot topic in the world of astronautics. A human mission is uh, unlikely to take place this decade but the next, why not? And this raises the questions of knowing whether it is worth it or how much it would cost. Because apart from the risks of failure and uh, the huge complexity, an obvious limiting factor is the cost. It is estimated to roughly $500 billion dollars this is a lot, or not that much, depending on how you look at it. If you compare it to the world's economy, $500 billion is not that much. The world's GDP is 87 trillions. So half a trillion would be 0.6% of one year of the world's economy. In other terms, it is equivalent to two days of economic activity on Earth. As a species, 
the perspective to try and go to another planet for the first time ever, for the equivalent to two days of work, doesn't seem that much. And it can also be argued that this spending is also an investment for a part. This is the kind of projects that need research in materials, processes, fuels, equipments of all sorts that could have other beneficial uses. But still, this amount is well above the budget of any space agency or private investor. And it would certainly not be profitable financially. There are resources that could be exploited on Mars by a human community living there, like water, metals, and maybe many other materials to be discovered. But there is probably no treasure to find. It would be for the sake of knowledge, for science for the challenge itself, or the perspective to uh, one day establish a permanent human presence on Mars. It has been argued that this last point made sense as a, a species for humankind. A presence on different planets strongly reduces the risk of extinction, if we wish to consider this a goal. Because apart from that, there are plenty of places on Earth that are currently unpopulated by man, and that would be much easier and cheaper to colonize, like the poles and arctic regions, deserts, or even the bottom of the seas. Each are inhospitable, but they are still way more welcoming than Mars for us even in the terrible cold and lack of vegetation of the Antarctic, for example, where the only human presence is scientific basis. At least there is air to breathe, there is pressure, so you can go out without a pressurized suit, and the temperature is actually almost pleasant if you compare it with Mars. The atmosphere is too thin to retain heat at night, and it is farther away from the sun than Earth. So the average temperature is minus 60 degrees Celsius, which is minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. At best, the temperature near the equator during the day can rise up to 20 degrees Celsius, 70 Fahrenheit. It doesn't sound too bad, but in the same location, the temperature at night will drop to uh, minus 73 Celsius, minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. There is no place on Earth where the temperature varies by uh, 100 degrees in a single day. Add to this the absence of air, the atmosphere is a hundred times less dense, and it is 95% carbon dioxide, so there is nothing to breathe for us. The problem of radiation, the dust storms that can rage for weeks. This is actually very harsh, and any human community would have a precarious situation, living only thanks to their equipment. They would probably need to find shelter underground, or at least under anti-radiation domes, and they would desperately need to find water from which they could extract oxygen and uh, irrigation for food production. They would also need to produce energy, probably with solar panels, and this is also a risk if the sun is hidden by dust for an extended period of time. They would have to pressurize the place where they live. These represent many elements of risk, and they could not afford to fail on any of them. Now, for the same amount of funding, 
it would be so much easier to create an entire underground or underwater city on Earth that could exist and function completely cut from the rest of the world. It doesn't sound useful and no one is going to invest in this, but if the argument in favor of establishing bases on Mars is to gain living space or compartment humanity to protect it from extinction, it doesn't really work that well, considering that it could be done on Earth. But still, the challenge is fascinating, I think, and I hope a human mission to Mars will one day leave Earth and succeed. One of the interesting questions it could answer would be the presence of traces of life on the planet, even if it is long extinct or asleep. If life appeared at some point on another planet of the solar system, then it would strongly suggest that the conditions that allow the existence of life are not that extraordinary. That would be a powerful argument in favor of the existence of life in uh, multiple locations, multiple places in our galaxy. But a base and a few scientists look absolutely possible, however difficult it is, in a not so distant future. Now it is not forbidden to dream, and uh, longer term, the concept that has circulated since the 20th century is the idea of transforming Mars or other planets to make them more similar to Earth and habitable by man and Earth-like life. As you know, this is called terraforming. What is terraforming and is it just a dream or something that could happen for real. The concept appeared in science fiction in the 1940s. It is not that recent. The first notable scientific article about it was written by an astronomer, Carl Sagan, in 1961. And in this article, he proposed a theoretical way of transforming the planet Venus to make it habitable. At the time, it was known that Venus had a very dense atmosphere that created a powerful greenhouse effect and it kept temperatures at the surface at levels that were unbearable, hundreds of degrees. The composition of the atmosphere was roughly known. It had water, nitrogen and carbon dioxide. So he proposed the idea of seeding this atmosphere with algae. It is so dense that algae would have stayed in suspension. They wouldn't have fallen to the ground and be incinerated. Algae would have converted the components of the atmosphere into organic compounds by feeding on them, especially carbon dioxide. This would have progressively removed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and reduced this greenhouse effect until temperatures dropped to more comfortable levels and the carbon would have remained captive in a blanket of matter that would have fallen to the surface. The oxygen would have risen to make the air breathable. That was clever, but later discoveries showed that it couldn't work because the clouds of Venus are very rich in sulfuric acid that would have destroyed algae. And another problem, even more insurmountable, was that the atmosphere was just too dense. Algae would maybe break carbon dioxide into carbon and oxygen, but oxygen would have stayed high, whereas pure carbon would have fallen down to the surface, 
be incinerated and through combustion would have returned to the atmosphere as a gas. Sagan also proposed a terraforming project for Mars in the 1970s, and because it is certainly the planet most similar to Earth in the solar system, the concept of terraforming Mars has stayed around for decades. As we saw earlier, it is not impossible that Mars had an Earth-like environment in its history long ago, with a thicker atmosphere and abandoned water, possibly liquid water. If the mechanisms that made this atmosphere change happened, they could maybe be reversed. I told you before about the likely reasons that made Mars lose most of its atmosphere. There is no magnetic field, so solar wind tends to erode the atmosphere by carrying it away. Then there is the lower gravity than Earth. Mars has 60% less gravitational pull at its surface. Something that weighs a hundred pounds on Earth weighs 38 pounds on Mars. So people walking on the surface could not make big jumps like astronauts on the moon, but they would definitely feel lighter than on our planet. It also means that the atmosphere is less bound to the planet than in the case of other more massive planets. And finally, the last reason for the loss of this atmosphere is that when there is carbon dioxide in an atmosphere and water is present, it tends to react with rocks at the surface to form carbonates, which are solid salts. So this tends to draw atmosphere off and bind it to the surface. This happens on Earth, but due to volcanic activity that ejects new gases into the atmosphere, there is a kind of balance and the Earth's atmosphere doesn't get eroded by its absorption into the surface. So between these various effects, Mars' atmosphere was probably, in the past, carried away into space and absorbed by the planet itself. These problems are due to the mass of Mars, the lack of enough volcanic activity, and the absence of a planetary magnetic field. These problems cannot go away easily. This is what Mars is. And for these reasons, it looks complicated to give it an Earth-like atmosphere. Because even assuming it could be done, technically and financially, this atmosphere would be unstable and would need constant maintenance, constant readjustments to stay in place. It would have to be replaced artificially as it tends to get thinner without intervention. There are other technical problems. In order to be habitable, this atmosphere would have to be heated. But Mars received less light than Earth from the Sun because of the distance. The light level is about 60% of Earth only. So if an atmosphere with the same composition and density as Earth was created, with the same greenhouse effect that retains heat, it would still be insufficient to raise the temperature above 0 degrees Celsius, and water would stay frozen instead of becoming liquid. And then, even if all of this could be overcome, the soils are toxic for us. They contain a lot of chlorine, too much to make them proper for agriculture. They would also have to be chemically modified. All of these problems, and there are others, 
actually have solutions that are theoretically possible and often within our technological reach. But in practice, it clearly looks undoable for the moment at the scale of an entire planet. We just don't have enough energy and the possibility to send the huge equipment necessary to Mars. But let's imagine we tried. What could be the methods employed to uh, terraform Mars? The starting point would have to be to generate a greenhouse effect that is mostly absent at the moment by injecting gases into the atmosphere. These gases would trap solar heat near the surface and help start a process of global heating that could one day make water at the poles and underground melt. They would also increase pressure and make it more bearable for humans. At the moment, the pressure is just 1% of Earth pressure. So a pressurized suit is absolutely necessary. But if this pressure reached just 25 or 30% of Earth, it would already be possible to go out without a suit. Just an oxygen mask would be sufficient. There are compounds with a uh, significant greenhouse effect, like ammonia and hydrocarbons, that are abundant in the solar system and could be imported to Mars. We know where to find them, for example, on the moons of Jupiter. But these compounds are relatively light, and it could be hard, especially at the start, to make them stay around the planet. Another option would be to release gases with very powerful greenhouse effects into the atmosphere, like fluorine compounds. This includes the famous CFCs that became known for attacking the ozone layer on Earth. But they also are very powerful greenhouse gases. In fact, they are thousands of times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Fluorine is present in Mars crust in higher quantity than on Earth, as far as we know. So an idea could be to manufacture these compounds from the materials present in the soil and release them into the atmosphere. Or, alternatively, send rockets with payloads of compressed CFCs. When it comes to warming the planet, a proposed solution would be to use orbital mirrors to redirect more sunlight to the surface. They could also be targeted at the poles and their layer of solid carbon dioxide to try and sublimate it and help kickstart the greenhouse effect. Another necessity would be to oxygenate this atmosphere if it gets dense and hot enough. Science fiction often uses the idea of seeding the planet with algae, or vegetation in general. This could help, but this is not such a good solution, because the net production of oxygen by terrestrial plants is quite small, even on Earth. Plants reabsorb oxygen at night. And in fact, on Earth, more than two-thirds of oxygen is produced, generated by the oceans. Liquid water would be uh, probably necessary to uh, fill the atmosphere with oxygen, and vegetal life that can initially resist extreme conditions of low pressure and uh, cold would have to be introduced. Or an alternative solution would be to create oxygen from water in industrial plants. As you know, oxygen is the main component of water with hydrogen. 
And finally, if all of this can be sorted out, there will always be the problem of Mars' inability to retain its atmosphere. So as a solution, the idea of creating an artificial magnetic field was proposed, which, in theory, could be achieved with superconducting rings built around the planet in which electric current would constantly circulate. At the scale of a planet, this is of course very uh, theoretical. So as you see, the terraforming of Mars is not for tomorrow, or even the day after tomorrow. But at the end of the day, technical solutions are not completely out of reach. It could become a viable project in the future, if mankind had considerable sources of cheap energy at its disposal, way more than today, but with equipment that could harvest the sun's energy or generate it through fusion, it is not completely unthinkable in several generations. Before we leave Mars, I told you we would visit a volcano. Mars may be smaller than Earth, but it is home to one of the largest and tallest mountains known in the solar system, Olympus Mount. Olympus Mount is an enormous shield volcano, that is to say a volcano that has grown a very wide base made of the lava it has ejected along its history. Olympus Mount has a surface as big as Italy or Great Britain, and its peak reaches 26 kilometers high, or 16 miles. That's more than twice Mount Everest. It is believed that such a large volcano could appear because of the lack of plate tectonics on Mars. On Earth, a lot of the energy and pressure and uh, the crust is released in rifts between plates, and volcanoes are not eternal. They are parts of plates that move, and at some point may disappear in the very, very long term. But when this mechanism doesn't exist, a volcano can stay in place and keep releasing lava for hundreds of millions of years. This is probably why and how Olympus Mounts could reach such a size. And this is interesting because if lava keeps nearing the surface on Mars, and assuming there are pockets of water trapped underground, then in some particular locations there may be liquid water under the surface, water heated by geothermy. There are so many other interesting things to say about Mars. It also has satellites, and we are at an exciting moment, historically, when it comes to space exploration. After the initial exploits of going to the Moon and sending probes to the various corners of the solar system in the 1960s, space exploration had slowed down in the following decades. But there is a resurgence happening at the moment with different actors. There is NASA, private companies, China, the ESA, Russia, Japan. Many of the missions and projects planned are collaborative. Maybe not with China, but in general they are. It still may seem painfully slow when you follow space news on a daily basis. These projects take years. But on a historical scale, it seems we are returning to the kind of excitement there used to be in the 1950s and the 1960s, and I'm happy about it. So we are now going to return to Earth because this is the end of our journey for tonight. 
As always, I hope you liked it and learned a few things. You can now let go and fall asleep. I'll talk to you soon with a new exploration journey. I think this time it will be about the history of ceramic. So, sleep well. Sweet dreams. <laughs>